the kingdom of legendary Gordius, the maker of the famed Gordian Anat, and his son Midas, who turned to gold everything that he touched. The ancient kingdom of Phrygia was a land of numerous Greek myths and legends, but also a great political power that prospered throughout the Iron Age. In this video, we will go through the complete history of Phrygia, from its mythological beginnings and legendary rulers, to its rise as a great power of the Iron Age and the ultimate fall before the new wave of invaders. The Phrygian history began in the dim past with the groups of tribes known as the Brigis. The Brigis originally inhabited the areas to the north of Greece, around Mount Calamon to the east and Mount Bermion to the west of ancient Macedon, as well as the mountainous pockets around the region of Pelagonia further west. According to the ancient sources, the bands of the Brigis had originally migrated from their homeland into Asia Minor several generations before the legendary Trojan War. As the Brigian settlers crossed the Hellespont and entered Asia, they changed their name from Brigis to Phrygis, or how we today call them, the Phrygians. This name change could have simply been due to a linguistic evolution of a group that was separated from its homeland, taking its own course of history. Either way, the Phrygians relatively quickly spread across the western Asia Minor, establishing various settlements and enclaves, from the valley of the Sangarius River to the north, going as far inland as Iconian, deep towards the territory of the Hittite Empire. Both Brigis and Phrygians are considered by the scholars to have been somewhat distantly related to the ancient Greeks, with whom the linguistic similarities were studied even by the ancient authors, such as Herodotus, Hesychius, Plato, and others. Cultural similarities were also shared with the neighboring Trachians, whose chief god Sabazios was venerated in the Phrygian religion. However, the main deity of the Phrygians was the mountain mother goddess known as Kibeli. Kibeli would also be venerated as a significant deity to various peoples across Asia Minor and would be later adopted even by the Greeks, although with a much smaller role. During their beginnings in Asia Minor, the Phrygians were not unified into a single state, but scattered around various valleys and mountains, whose cities were likely under the sway of their more established neighbors, such as the still powerful Hittites to the east, or their allies and subjects in western Anatolia. According to the Greek legend, the first known Phrygian ruler was Nanakus, or Anacus, who established his realm around the city of Iconian, the easternmost Phrygian settlement in Asia at the time. Name Anacus, being essentially the same word as Anax, meaning king, could have simply been a derivation name applied to an otherwise unknown eponymous ruler, presented as a mythical ancestor, a common practice of the ancient Greek tradition. After Anacus, the next known ruler at Iconian was King Manes, or Mazdis. Not much is known about this ruler other than his exploits being highly regarded by his people. This could have been due to an expansion of territory or influence, likely on a local scale, or simply the projects that had benefited the inhabitants. Either way, according to Plutarch, Great things carried adjective manic in the Phrygian speech in honor and legacy of King Manes. Besides Iconian, 
The main areas of the Phrygian settlement included the valley of the Sangarius River, which constituted the core Phrygian territory, but also the Ascanian Lake to the west, the city of Acmania further inland to the south, and various other, often remote, areas. One of those was considered to be the homeland of the mythical Tantalus, the legendary father of King Pelops of Pisa, whose descendants would eventually go on to establish the royal house of Atreus, the final ruling dynasty of Mycenae. According to another legend, however, Pelops was originally from Arcadia, or Olenus of northern Peloponnese, and therefore not a Phrygian, but a true Achaean. Either way, the realm of Tantalus was thought to have been in western Asia Minor, around the area of Mount Sipolus, later a part of the kingdom of Lydia. King Tantalus would go on to commit various atrocities, including killing of his own son, for which he was punished by the Olympian gods and sent to the deepest regions of underworld for eternity. Two of the most famous among the Phrygian mythological rulers, however, were the legendary kings Gordius and Midas that ruled over the realm of the Sangarius Valley. Gordius started as a farmer belonging to the royal family of the Brigis, residing near the later region of Macedon. When an eagle landed on his ox cart, young Gordius interpreted it as a divine sign and traveled to the eastern Phrygia in Asia Minor in a cult center of Telmisos to consult the oracle of god Sebasius and make an offering. Meanwhile, the nearby Phrygians apparently had no ruler and also came to Telmisos in order to consult the oracle on who should be selected as their leader. The oracle told them that the first man to ride up to the god's temple on a cart should be acclaimed their new king. That man was Gordius who after having dedicated the mentioned ox cart to Sabazios, tied it to a post with an incredibly intricate knot, and thus became the new Phrygian king, giving birth to the famous legend of the Gordian knot. King Gordius then went to found the city of Gordian, the new capital of his kingdom. The successor of Gordius was his adopted son Midas, who according to the sources also came from the tribe of Brigis. Medus's birthplace was said to have been under the Mount Bermion, near the land of Macedon. Herodotus mentions the existence of Wild Rose Garden at the foot of Mount Bermion, calling it the Garden of Medus, son of Gordius, whose roses grew of themselves, each bearing sixty blossoms of surpassing fragrance. According to the legend, Midas was as a boy adopted by King Gordius and designated as the successor to the Phrygian throne. Upon Gordius's death, Midas became the new ruler and began working towards enlarging his realm and fortune. He was credited with the foundation of the city of Ankira to the east, as well as the town of Midion to the west, which he dedicated to himself. The legend has it that King Midas was once confronted by god Dionysus, who asked the wealthy king about his greatest wish. Greedy Midas chose the power of the Golden Touch, which enabled him to turn to gold everything that he came in contact with. This ability, however, ultimately became Midas' greatest curse, as he was not able to eat or drink, as even food and water were becoming gold as soon as he touched them. One version has it that King Midas eventually died out of the starvation, while another one says that he lived on, giving up on his golden touch and growing to resent material wealth. The Phrygian king had at least two sons. One was Ancharos, 
the designated successor whose tragical fate did not allow him to succeed his father. Towards the end of Midas's reign, a natural catastrophe occurred as the earth opened around the area of the Phrygian town of Kelenai. As King Midas consulted the oracle, he was commanded to throw into it the most precious thing that he possessed. As Midas threw inside a great quantity of gold and silver, the chasm nevertheless still stood open. Eventually, Prince Ankaras, considering himself the most precious thing his father possessed, jumped into the chasm, tragically ending his own life, but also causing the earth opening to immediately close. Midas's other offspring, Lytierzes, also living in Kalinae, was not a legitimate son and therefore not qualified to succeed his father on the throne. Lytierzes was said to have been a great warrior, but also aggressive and bloodthirsty, as he challenged people to harvesting contests and then upon winning, killed and beheaded his former opponents. Ultimately, Lytierzes would meet a similar fate, as one of the opponents was none other than Heracles, who won the contest and then battled Lytierzes, killing the Phrygian warrior and throwing his body into the Meander River. Following the death of Midas, the throne was ultimately bestowed to Dimas, son of Ioneus, who became the new Phrygian king. Demas married the nymph Eunoe and with her had at least three children. His two sons were Otreus and Asius, while his daughter was Hecuba. It was during the reign of Demas that Priam became the king of Troy and the alliance between the two was soon concluded. Demas's daughter Hecuba was married to King Priam, ensuring the continuous friendship between the two rulers and their respective kingdoms. Around this time, the Phrygians entered hostilities with the neighboring Amazons, a legendary tribe of women warriors inhabiting the northern areas of Asia Minor. Besides the Trojan allies, King Dimas also enjoyed support from the other lands inhabited by the Phrygian tribes, such as Acmonia, ruled by Migdon, son of the eponymous ruler Acmon. Referred by Homer as the godlike Migdon, he enjoyed the utmost respect among the Phrygians, being a renowned warrior. It is unknown whether or not King Demas passed away during this time, but the tradition has his son Otreus ascending to the throne and joining forces with Migdon and Priam in a war against the Amazons. The decisive battle took place on the banks of the Sangarius River and the Phrygians emerged victorious. Following the victory, both Phrygians and Trojans enjoyed a short time of prosperity until yet another, much bigger war broke out. As the Trojan prince Paris abducted the Spartan queen Helen, the Aulachian coalition was gathered under the supreme command of the Mycenaean king Agamemnon and declared war on Troy. Among the Trojan allies were all of the Phrygian lands, including their kings and chieftains. Representing the Phrygian kingdom of the Sangarius Valley was Demas's other son and Otreus's brother, Asius, together with his own sons, Adamas and Phinops. The contingent from Acmonia was led by Coroibus, the son of legendary Migdon. A large Phrygian force was also dispatched from Lake Ascania, led by their chieftains Ascanius and Forkis. The war itself was long and devastating for all sides involved. After ten long years of warfare, the Achaeans ultimately prevailed 
and the city of Troy was destroyed and burned to the ground. All of the involved Phrygian leaders were among the fallen. The fate of King Otreus, however, is not known, as he apparently did not take part in the war himself, but continued to rule back home. Furthermore, the town of Otria, founded in honor of King Otreus, was located along the Ascanian Lake, implying that the region eventually came under the authority of Otreus, likely the last of the mythological kings of Phrygia. From this point on, the Phrygians entered the historical records as the neighboring long-standing Hittite empire to the east finally met its end. Around 1190 BCE, the Hittite capital of Hattusa was sacked and destroyed, while the remnants of the kingdom, together with the final king of Hatti, Shupiluliuma II, were vanquished in 1178 BCE. The Egyptian sources mention a broad confederation of both land and sea-based powers, collectively known to the modern scholars as the Sea Peoples. While the Caspian tribes from the north were likely the ones responsible for the destruction of Hattusa and its core territory, other neighboring powers also played a role in the Hittite disintegration. To the east, the emerging Assyrians took much of the Hatti-held territory, while to the west, it were likely the Phrygians that expanded at the expense of the vanishing Hittites. In the following decades, the Assyrians also seem to mention the Phrygians in their historical records for the first time under the name Mushki. As the Phrygians themselves possessed no writing system of their own, any definite conclusion is difficult to determine with absolute certainty, leaving us with no names of the Phrygian kings and rulers throughout this early period. According to the Assyrian records, in 1112 BCE, five Phrygian kings had joined an anti-Assyrian coalition confronting the great king Tiglat Pileser in the land of Kumuni. The Assyrian ruler described these events as following. In the beginning of my reign, 20,000 men of the land of Mushki and their five kings, who for 50 years had held the lands of Alzi and Purukuzi, which in the past had paid tribute and tax unto Asher, my lord, and no king had vanquished them in battle. In their own strength they trusted, and came down and seized the land of Kumuhi. With the help of Asher, my lord, I gathered my chariots and my troops. I looked not behind me. With their twenty thousand warriors and their five kings I fought in the land of Kumuhi, and I defeated them. This account, written in Tiglat Pileser's Annals, clearly shows that the Phrygians represented a force to be reckoned with. The Phrygian rulers, apparently still divided into several realms, started consolidating their power and gradually increased their influence. To the west, the core Phrygian territories bordered the land of Mycia. This border, however, never appeared to have been fixed, as various Phrygian settlements existed in the territory considered to be a part of Mycia, and therefore making any clear distinction difficult to establish. Further west was the coastal Asia Minor, which was from the 11th century BCE in the process of being colonized by the incoming settlers from Greece. Now it is unclear if the Phrygian elites eventually adopted the cultural traits of the incoming Greek colonists 
among whom were no doubt the descendants of the former Mycenaeans, or if they had rather already been influenced by the Mycenaean Greece in the past due to their contact with the Achaeans, but either way, the Phrygians did appear to carry many of the old Mycenaean elements, such as noble and royal titles, a practice that would survive well into the historical times until the very fall of Phrygia. At the top of the Phrygian society was a king called the Venectae, corresponding to the Mycenaean title of Venex. The king was likely accompanied by a council of nobles belonging to the Phrygian aristocracy. Below the aristocracy were the free people, many of which lived on the countryside as farmers and shepherds, but also inside the Phrygian cities as merchants, blacksmiths and various other occupations. Just like everywhere else at the time, the bottom of the Phrygian society consisted of slaves, captured during many Phrygian raids and campaigns against the surrounding tribes. In the following years, the Phrygians continued their operations eastwards, and by the year 1000 BCE, the city of Ankira was being used as one of the main Phrygian fortifications under the authority of Gordian. These campaigns brought under the Phrygian rule the tribes inhabiting what the Hittites knew as the lands of Cassia and Kalashma. It is very likely that the dynasty at Gordian established supremacy over the rest of the Phrygian realms by this time, as the Phrygian operations now seem to have been unified under the supreme command of the Phrygian capital. The Gordian rulers also likely traced their origins all the way back to the legendary kings Gordius and Midas, since these two names would appear rather frequently among the later Phrygian rulers. Either way, the power and influence of Gordian would soon expand in all directions, either voluntarily or by the force of arms. By the 10th century BCE, the Kingdom of Phrygia rose up as the main power in Western Asia Minor, with the monumental construction projects taking place at the capital city of Gordian. A large wall was constructed around the Gordian citadel and included an extensive gate complex. The main citadel gate was to the east, made 10 meters tall and served as both the increased defense and projection of the rising Phrygian power. From Gordian, the Phrygians ruled over vast territory much larger than those of their neighbors. One of those neighbors, the Mycenaeans, would soon be subjugated, enabling Phrygia to establish the direct border with the Aeolian Greeks to the west. The relationship with Greeks, however, were that of friendship and partnership, as the Aeolian cities were relatively wealthy and powerful themselves, with all sides profiting from trade and cultural affinity that appeared to have been on a steady rise. Starting from the 9th century BCE, numerous royal Timoli burials were constructed at Gordian, further proving the increased wealth and power of the Phrygian rulers. At around 800 BCE, however, a large fire spread over the eastern portion of the Gordian citadel, causing severe damage and near destruction. As there appears to be no outside attack associated with this event, it is widely believed that it had been an accident, especially as it by no means slowed down the rise of the Phrygian power. The citadel was almost immediately rebuilt to a much larger scale, with the city itself expanded to its greatest size. It is from this time that the Phrygian settlements started getting established significantly east of the Halys River, reaching the heartland of the former Hittite kingdom. The surrounding regions such as Paphlagonia to the north and Bithynia to the northwest likely existed as lands tributary to the Phrygian kings. 
Besides the rise of political power and economic influence, the Phrygian culture also flourished, with many of its elements expanding beyond the Phrygian borders. The Phrygian music was well known in the Hellenic world, with the so-called Phrygian mode considered to be the warlike mode in the ancient Greek music. Another invention from Phrygia was the aulos, or the double flout, also soon adopted by the neighboring Greeks, where it became one of the more popular instruments. Phrygian artistic depictions often included animals such as horses, bulls and lions, as well as mythological creatures well known from the Greek mythology such as centaurs, griffins and sphinxes. Perhaps one of the most well-known traits of the Phrygian culture was the famous Phrygian cap, a soft conical cap with the apex bent over, by which the Phrygians were almost instantly recognized, especially by their Greek neighbors. It was soon after this time that the Greek sources bring us the first known historical Phrygian ruler, a king named Gordias, the namesake of the legendary king that founded the city of Gordian. No details are known about the reign of this second Gordias, other than his name being mentioned in a passage by Herodotus. However, the construction of a large chamber tomb at the heart of the Great Timulus is dated to have taken place in the 8th century BCE, corresponding to the reign of Gordias, a construction previously attributed to his son Midas. The archaeologists discovered an almost intact royal burial dating to about 740 BCE, containing the remains of a large funeral feast, including extensive amount of vessels and pottery. Together with those remains were also the remains of a wooden coffin and a skeleton of a buried ruler, about 1.6 meters tall, estimated to have died at about 60 years of age. This discovery perfectly corresponds with King Gordias, who according to the ancient sources, ruled until 738 BCE. Following the death of Gordias, his son and successor Midas ascended to the throne of Phrygia. Much like his father, King Midas was also the second known ruler under this name, after his mythological ancestor and namesake Midas of the Golden Touch. However, unlike that of his father, the reign of the historical King Midas is much better attested in the ancient sources. Upon ascension to the Phrygian throne, Midas found his kingdom in a great shape. Good relations with the Aeolian Greeks to the west gave Phrygians the access to the Aegean Sea trade, which went through the island of Euboea and further connected with the Hellenic world. One of the principal cities of the Aeolian coast was the polis of Kimi, ruled by a king named Agamemnon, a descendant of Agamemnon of Mycenae through Cleues and Malaos, the founders of the city and themselves the grandsons of the last Mycenaean king, Tissamenus. That Midas and Agamemnon were on the friendly terms further proves the fact that the king of Kimi married his daughter Harmadiki to his Phrygian counterpart. Harmadiki, also called Damadiki depending on the source, was described as a woman distinguished by beauty and wisdom, being credited with the invention or at least contribution to the development of the Greek alphabet. As the earliest Greek alphabetic inscriptions date to sometime around 800 BCE or shortly afterwards, it is likely that Harmodiki rather played a role in its development in Aeolis, a version almost identical to the Phrygian alphabet, both dating to a time approximate to Demidas in Phrygia and Agamemnon in Kimi. Either way, King Midas was very fond of his connections with the Greeks and highly respected the oracle at Delphi. According to Herodotus, 
Midas was the first foreigner to make an offering at Delphi, which was done in the form of a royal throne, which the Greek historian described as well worth seeing. On the other hand, unlike the friendly relations the Phrygian king established with the Greeks to the west, territories to the east of the kingdom were anything but friendly. In fact, it was the Eastern Asia Minor which King Midas was never able to bring to his terms. To the southeast of the Phrygian territory, the successors of the late Hittite Empire were largely existing as the vassal states of the re-emerging Assyrian Empire, ruled by the great king Tiglat-Pileser III. As Tiglat-Pileser passed away in 727 BCE, he was succeeded by Shalmaneser V, who only reigned for about five years. In 722 BCE, Shalmaneser was deposed by the new ruler, Sargon II. Such political turbulence in Assyria was perceived as weakness by some of their client states, but also by King Midas of Phrygia. After securing an alliance with King Ambaris of the neighboring Tabal, Midas reached out to the city of Carchemish, ruled by King Pesiri, a longtime vassal of the Assyrian Empire. Pesiri was encouraged to revolt against his Assyrian overlords by Midas, who was looking to further his own influence at the expense of the Assyrians. This caused a huge strain in the relations between the two powers, and in 717 BCE, King Sargon II marched with his army against the Carchemish rebels. Despite the Phrygian support, King Pesiri was soundly defeated, captured and deported to Assyria as a prisoner of war. The city of Carchemish was subsequently repopulated with the Assyrian settlers, becoming an imperial province. In the following years, the standoff between Midas and Sargon continued as the two powers came to the brink of an open military conflict after the Assyrian subjugation of Tabal in 713 BCE. To the northeast, the appearance and rise of nomadic and warlike Chimerians marked the end of the local tribes that had previously inhabited the region. Chimerians were nomadic people who, according to Herodotus, had previously inhabited the Eurasian steppe. Eventually, under the pressure of the Scythian tribes, Chimerians moved first to Caucasus and then further into the Asia Minor. To make things worse for Midas, this moment of uncertainty was used by the Assyrian governor of Kilikia, who himself started conducting raids into the Phrygian territory. However, as the Chimerians approached closer, the land of Tabal under King Gurdi rebelled against Assyria and made alliance with the Chimerians. This prompted both Sargon and Midas to finally put the animosity aside and conduct peace, which is finally realized in 707 BCE. In 705 BCE, King Sargon of Assyria personally marched against Tabal in order to finally subdue the kingdom and defeat Chimerians at the same time. While the Assyrian army proved to be superior on the battlefield, King Sargon died in battle and the further Assyrian advance was halted. A year later, however, in 704 BCE, Sargon's successor Sennacherib sent out a force that finally brought the Baal back under the Assyrian hegemony killing the rebel king Gurdi and forcing the Chimerians to temporarily retreat from harassing the Assyrian territories. In the following period, it became evident that the Chimerians turned their attention westwards and it was King Midas that had to prepare for the inevitable war.
the Chimerian invaders started openly conducting raids into the Phrygian territory, finally culminating with an attack on Paphlagonia and completely devastating the longtime clients of Phrygia. At this point, it became clear that a full-scale war between the Phrygian kingdom and the warlike Chimerians was inevitable. After many skirmishers and raids conducted by both sides, the Phrygian army finally met the Chimerian force in 695 BCE and a decisive battle was fought. In the end, the Chimerian army came out victorious, with Phrygians suffering a crushing defeat, with their forces almost completely wiped out. This defeat came as a shock to the Phrygians, who soon saw their territory rapidly conquered by the invaders. Within short period of time, the Chimerians reached the Phrygian capital of Gordian. King Midas, unwilling to be captured by the invading enemy, decides to commit suicide, which was according to the legend, done by drinking the bull's blood. With Midas' death, so ended the existence of the independent Phrygian kingdom. The city of Gordian was soon destroyed as well, with Chimerians overrunning the remaining Phrygian territory. In the following years and decades, the subdued Phrygians were recorded among the forces of the Chimerian king Teushpa battling the Assyrian Empire to the east. Although it is unknown whether it was Teushpa or his predecessor that conquered Phrygia, it clearly showed that it were now the Chimerians who were in control of much of Asia Minor. However, the Chimerians at this point found themselves surrounded by numerous enemies as the fall of Phrygia gave way to the rise of some of their neighbors, chief among them the Kingdom of Lydia. In 680 BCE, the new Lydian king, Gigis, ascended to the throne, determined to expand his realm and combat the Chimerians. The following year, Chimerian king Teushpa died in a war against the Assyrians, and in 665 BCE, Gigis himself waged war on the invading Chimerians, ultimately emerging victorious. However, another Chimerian invasion was waged against Lydia in 657 BCE, but Gigis was able to once again fight off the enemy. Ultimately, in 644 BCE, the third Chimerian attack proved fatal for the Lydians, with the Lydian king Gigis killed and the Lydian capital Sardis sacked. It is unknown whether or not the Phrygians had a role in these battles, but it appears that the remnants of their kingdom survived as the Chimerian subjects. The Chimerian-Lydian wars continued in the following decades, with the Lydian forces under King Aliates finally prevailing and together with their allies permanently expelling the Chimerians from Asia Minor. It appears that during this time, the Phrygian capital of Gordian had recovered from the previous Chimerian destruction, with the Phrygian dynasty emerging once again, this time as the subjects of Lydia. The ruler of Phrygia at this time appears to have been yet another third king named Midas, who was in turn succeeded by yet another third Gordius. In 609 BCE, the Assyrian Empire to the east fell to the hands of the Babylonian and Median empires, allowing the Lydians to further expand their influence to the east. 
their former allies, the Scythians, who had contributed in defeating the Chimerians, were now themselves defeated and expelled by the expanding Medes, which Aliates further used to consolidate the kingdom of Lydia as the dominant power in Western Asia Minor. Aliates' son and successor, Croesus, became the new king in 585 BCE and apparently enjoyed very friendly relations with his Phrygian subjects. During the reign of Croesus, an intrigue developed on the Phrygian court as Gordius' son Adrastus killed his brother in an accident and was subsequently banished by his father. The Phrygian prince came to the Lydian capital Sardis, to the court of Croesus, where he was purified by the Lydian king and received as a friend of the royal house. Subsequently, Prince Adrastus was to stay at the Lydian court as an honored guest. However, Another fatal intrigue would occur as Croesus' own son and heir, Attis, decided to go on a boar hunt in Mycia. King Croesus, overly worried about his son due to a bad omen, asked Adrastus to accompany Attis during the Mycian hunt. The king's fear ultimately did come to reality, as during the hunting expedition, Adrastus threw a spear at the boar but missed the target, hitting Attis instead and killing the crown prince of Lydia on the spot. Upon returning to Sardis, Adrastus immediately went to Croesus, asking for himself to be killed. The king, however, refused to have the Phrygian prince executed and was ready to grant him forgiveness. However, it was not to be, as Adrastus ended his own life, committing suicide over the tomb of Attis. Croesus himself would rule until 564 BCE when he was ultimately defeated and his kingdom absorbed by the Persian Empire of King Cyrus the Great. The Phrygians themselves did not accept the Persian takeover and in the coming months gathered their own force in order to resist the advance of Cyrus. The last Phrygian stand was ultimately defeated by the overwhelming Persian force and siege was soon laid against the city of Gordian. After the fall of the Phrygian capital, the Persians made Phrygia one of their satrapies, ruled by a Persian governor with a provincial capital moved from Gordian to the Scillian. A Persian Pharnakid dynasty was installed as hereditary rulers of the Phrygian satrapy, which was during the 5th century BCE divided into two smaller satrapies, the Hellespontine Phrygia and the Greater Phrygia. The Pharnakid satraps would continue to rule over Hellespontine Phrygia until 334 BCE when the king of Macedon, Alexander the Great, crossed the Hellespont and began his conquest of the Persian Empire. In 333 BCE, King Alexander arrived to Gordian, where he was presented with a thousand years old riddle of the Gordian Knot. As the ancient prophecy said that whoever was able to loosen the knot would be destined to rule all of Asia, Alexander pulled his sword and cut the legendary knot, splitting it in two. He was subsequently regarded as a liberator and a great king, and over the course of the next ten years proceeded to conquer the entirety of the Achaemenid Persian Empire. As Alexander's conquests saw heavy Hellenization of the lands he obtained, the case was no different with Phrygia, which due to its close cultural affinity with the Hellenic culture, almost instantly adopted the Greek alphabet and soon became a true Hellenistic society. 
Following Alexander's death in 323 BCE, the land of Phrygia passed hands multiple times during the War of the Diadochi and the subsequent Hellenistic kingdoms. Finally, in 133 BCE, the Hellenistic Phrygia became a part of the Roman Republic. The name and legacy of Phrygia would continue throughout the following millennia, as the legendary Gordius, Midas and their successors continued to be studied and admired by the Romans, Greeks and their successors, never to be forgotten. Please consider subscribing and sharing the video, as this is a one-person production and it greatly helps the visibility of the channel. Special thanks to History with Sai, Nico, Chris Ernst, Panayotis Yanopoulos, Fred Lecky, and Estate Care for their continuous support. If you wish to join our Patreon community, feel free to click the link in the video description. This was 1XTV, and we'll see you again soon.